moly, ladies and gents. We're at the final ultimate ending of season one, House of the Dragon. And holy shit, <laughs> does it end on one hell of a high. Absolutely loved it. So without further ado, let's dive straight in. Thank you so much for tuning into the video. It goes without saying, but as with all my other videos of the review of this show, this is going to contain heavy, heavy spoilers. So if you haven't seen episode 10 yet, make sure you add this to your watch later list and come back at a later time. Episode 10, The Black Queen. Holy crap. There's so much going on in this episode, but let's just start from the beginning. I'm going to share exactly what I loved about it, what I thought could have been better, very little, and what a way to end season one. It's going to culminate in an almighty war in season two, but let's just kick things off. So we start the episode with Rhaenyra and Luke talking about the sea snake, talking about the expectations of the house, about how uh, Driftmark is going to be left to ruin, who's going to have the rightful claim, how we're going to move forward with Viserys' death. Then they talk about the struggles of being in a position of that sort of magnitude. Rhaenyra says, do you know what? I struggle myself every day. I try and find the best of both worlds. And Luke's kind of like, oh my God. He's not, she's not really shedding any gospel or any wisdom, but he's listening to his mum and she's laying down the smackdown and he's absolutely lapping it up, saying you're going to be a great queen. You're absolutely an inspiration. And she then gets a note from one of the maesters and the maester says, uh, Princess Rhaenys is here and she requests an audience with yourself and Damon. So we then get another scene where Rhaenys is talking to Rhaenyra and Damon. She instantly comes out with Viserys is dead. You can see the shock and the awe on Damon and Rhaenyra's face. Absolutely gutted. They kind of knew it was coming. But she quickly follows up with Aegon has been crowned. So not only is your father dead, but Alicent has now taken her son, put him on the throne, basically to piss you off. It's all shit stirring tactics, but in a way it is still true. Alicent is standing by what she believes Viserys wanted before he died, which is talking about the Song of Ice and Fire, talking about the prince that was promised, i.e. Aegon. Absolutely wasn't Aegon that Viserys was talking about, as we know, but... I love how they sort of break the fourth wall with this. We've got an understanding of what's happened in previous scenes that other characters haven't. And they're sort of leaning on that. Damon then says, how did he die? Straight away, he's skeptical. He said he was in fairly good health. We saw him walk into the throne room. How has this happened all of a sudden? Instantly accuses Alison of foul play and says that he's been slain. Asks also how Rhaenys is alive. Rhaenys sort of says, well, I defended your name. They were all doing this in the throne room. They went into the Red Keep. Then they crowned Aegon in front of absolutely everybody. I didn't like it, so I decided to get on Dragon back and fly off. And Damon's like, but yet you're still alive. He's a bit suspect about how she's managed to get away. She says that she is here to relay a message as a messenger. And it's based on her house and her siblings. And basically gives a warning to Rhaenyra and Damon that the Greens are coming, i.e., the house of Hightower. So we then get a scene where Rhaenyra is in labor for the sixth time, believe it or not. She's working on a football team. Damon's asking for the perimeter around the island to be secured. Says that the queen's going into labor. They're already talking about Rhaenyra being the queen. And this is where the episode name, the Black Queen, comes from. So she's going into labor with the sixth child, obviously Damon's child. He's trying to sort out a perimeter around the island. They're in Dragonstone. He says he wants all the best soldiers out the front, not to let anyone pass. And if there's any sighting of any type of dragon, to let him know. So he's going to go out and battle them and do what he needs to do. The kids of, or sons of Rhaenyra, I think it's Jaceris and Luke, are talking about where Damon is, asking the soldiers. And Rhaenyra actually says that he's gone to plan the war. She says to the eldest boy that her claim is now his by her command and says, no matter what happens to me, I'm, I'm telling you right here, right now, that you are going to be in charge. You're going to be the one that's going to have claim to the throne. You need to stand by that because people are coming for our claim. They're coming for our cause. They're coming for our family. They're dismissing everything that your grandfather told you, told me, all that kind of jazz. Damon then tries to command the army. And then one of the boys, I think it's Luke, comes in and says, did you not hear what I said? 
The Queen has ordered that we need to back down, that we need to focus on this. And he gets quite tasty. It was nice to see some of the personalities of the kids coming through. Because let's be honest, they got absolutely bullied by the Targaryen boys, what I call the Targaryen boys, Alicent's kids, in the prior episode. So it's good to see they're starting to form character. They're starting to form a little bit of a backbone and get some of that Targaryen blood pumping through their veins. They're ready for a scrap. They're ready to stand up by their mum. They're ready to stand up. They're sick of being pushed around. And we're starting to see that a lot more in this episode, which is great. Then we get a scene where Damon is speaking to some of the Kingsguard. And these guys have actually ran away from King's Landing. They've escaped to Dragonstone. There's some of the head white cloaks. And Damon's kind of stood there in front of them. They're kneeling at his feet and saying, we're here to serve Rhaenyra. And Damon says, ask, you know, confirm your loyalty to us. Show us that you're here for Rhaenyra. You're not here to just cause treachery. And they all sort of lay their swords out and say, Rhaenyra's our queen. We, you know, we stand by what the king said, Viserys. We stand by his claim and his last words. We don't believe Alison. She's a traitor to the crown, all that kind of shit. Aegon's also a wrongful king. He should never have been crowned. It's against the rules, all that kind of jazz. So they're very traditional. They're very much on what appears to be Daemon and Rhaenyra's side. So they pledge themselves to them. Whilst this is going on, we get an incredibly gruesome scene where Rhaenyra is given birth. And it's so detailed to the point where it's almost sickening. Not afraid of blood or anything like that, but there's all sorts falling out from inside. And she's in a lot of pain. She's bleeding heavily. She's dismissing the help of the handmaidens, which I think is a very stupid move. But she's just trying to show her pride. She's trying to show that she can do it. Um, and she do, the pain that she's feeling, she's trying to almost push through it and show that she can push through any kind of pain kind of a metaphor to what she's going for with everything else outside of giving birth i.e the resistance she's getting from the houses that have pledged allegiance to her in the beginning who pledged allegiance to her father so it's kind of like no i can deal with this it's the same as they don't want to doubt her when she becomes queen she wants them to leave that room and say do you know what she didn't need us she gave birth all on her own in huge amounts of pain I'm going to stand by this woman. And that's kind of what she's trying to achieve. At least that's what I thought that she was trying to do in this episode, in this scene. So she's given uh, birth, incredibly gruesome scene. She actually grabs the baby by her own bare hand and pulls it out. You literally see everything. The prosthetics is absolutely amazing. It looks so real. Um, I was eating my dinner at the time and I quickly stopped with the fork just in my mouth, just like... <laughs> eyes wide staring at the screen thinking am I actually seeing this in true Game of Thrones fashion it goes all in on the gore it goes all in on the gruesomeness of war it goes in on the gruesomeness of life and it wasn't afraid to go that next step we actually got a scene where the baby was a stillborn so she pulls it out it's led there on the table. It just slumps down on the table. You get all the sound, all the motion, the music's going. And you can see Rhaenyra's trying to revive it and to no avail. So quite quite a sad scene, quite emotionally you know, invested when you sit there and watch it. But again, it's the prosthetics and it was amazing. The, the intensity of the scene was unreal. And it kept flickering between Damon giving orders to the King's Guard and giving orders to the people to try and defend Dragonstone and to try and form a plan and also Rhaenyra who was given birth so it's a tale of two takes almost and um, it was just absolutely brutal and, and in a way disgusting but she wraps it in sort of bandaging and then we get a scene where she is placing the baby on an altar everyone sort of stood around Damon's sort of in the background as well and she's sort of given her peace and, and given her love over to it so then we see a Kingsguard, they go outside and there's another load of Kingsguard that turn up, some white cloaks. And it was actually one of the guys that was helping hunt Aegon in the previous episode. So what I said was one of the twins in the prior review. This particular Kingsguard is trying to sort of declare himself and all the followers of him to Rhaenyra's cause as the true queen. So he actually turns up, the music gets emotional, she sort of says, what are you doing here? And he pulls out the crown that Viserys obviously left behind, hands it over and says to Rhaenyra, I swear oath to you, you know, that we're not going anywhere, you're the one true queen, you should be on the throne, we're here to support you, here's your father's crown, as a sort of gesture of, 
their bond and their honour. So Damon takes the crown, places it on Rhaenyra's head and says, all hail the queen. Everyone sort of kneels. I noticed, though, that Rhaenys did not kneel. So the camera pans around. You see all the king's guard. Damon himself kneels as well. All the kids kneel. Everyone stood outside, basically, at Dragonstone. They all kneel apart from Rhaenys, who just sort of glances over and gives a little smile. So I did notice that she didn't kneel, which I think is a sign of things to come. We then get a scene where they're all stood around the council table in Dragonstone and they're recalling basically the old alliances, so the old bonds, the old uh, bannermen that were sworn to Viserys. So they're talking about what to do. Damon says we need to strike them at you know the heart of it. We need to go to them first. We need to start this and end it in one foul swoop. He has some great dialogue and says about you know how he's going to do this, how he's going to do that. He, go- he throws a few choice words in there about what he's going to do to certain people, but it's just it, his character is excellent. He's got an amazing story arc. He's got an amazing sort of persona about him, and I think even the producer and the directors that are on these episodes have been like, I don't understand the fascination with Damon, but he's absolutely brilliant. He's so diverse. He's so complex, but also very relatable at the same time. Not in the uh, the impotence thing. I just want to put that out there. There's nothing wrong with my uh, my sausage, but <laughs> it's, he's just very relatable. Very very much sort of on a comedy level, relatable. He just says it how it is. He just does the things that we all impulsively want to do, i.e. someone pisses you off. He he just wants to carve... He just carves people's heads off. He just does what he wants. But he's got some great sort of dry humour and dialogue as well, which what makes him a great character. It's the same thing that what made The Hang brilliant in Game of Thrones. And I think he's on the same sort of level. So anyway, going back to the episode itself. So they're recalling the alliances around the table. They're talking about how they're going to move forward with this, what they're going to do. There's very much a conflict of interest. Rhaenyra says that she wants things done amicably. She doesn't want to start a war. What's the point in ruling over a kingdom of ash? Damon basically says we need to strike them now. Why are we waiting? We're just sitting ducks. We've got dragons. Why don't we attack them? And someone else behind him sort of says, yeah, we've got dragons. Why don't we do this, this, and this? And Rhaenyra's like, we've only got a few dragons. They've got dragons as well, some of them which are definitely bigger than ours. And she also points out that a lot of their dragons haven't seen war. And Damon says, don't worry about it. I got it covered. I've actually hidden a clutch of dragon eggs in the mountain. They'll be ready to come out now. I could, I could do this, this, and this. There's also some wild dragons that haven't yet been tamed talks about and all of a sudden you just feel the vastness of the dragons you just feel that this is pre game of thrones pre daenerys this feels very much like the dragons are still here still in their element they're just as common as the sheep and the goats out on the mountains it's just it's great you just get a sense of the scale of almost the family tree of the dragons but also the different types of species you get they almost feel like dinosaurs and damon talks about them in that sort of way as well saying there's loads over there that we can claim there's a eggs, the eggs that are hatching, whereas in Game of Thrones, it's very much they are mystical, unique creatures because there's only three of them that we know of at that point um, that are alive. But this is the realm and time of the dragons. So they're, they're rife, they're everywhere. There's plenty of different types of them, different shapes, sizes, colors. Uh, Rhaenyra's just worried, again, because she says that none of them have seen war. So she's worried about how it's going to end. She's worried about what realistically they can do. As they're doing this, Mr. Otto turns up. So the Hand of the King turns up outside to shitster a little bit more and says he's here to deliver a message to Rhaenyra. So we know exactly what this is going to be. The King asks you to bend the knee, blah, blah, blah. And that's exactly what it is. Just as he's about to deliver it, Rhaenyra turns up behind him on Dragonback, swoops in, badass queen style with her new crown, walks past him so the dragon's behind him because there's no escape. And Otto says... Aegon the king is here I'm here to speak to you on his behalf he's here to offer you terms if you bend the knee essentially you can keep Dragonstone the house Valerian and also the king's guard who essentially are traitors in the king's eyes will be spared in exchange Damon turns around and says I'd rather feed my kids to the dragons than watch them become cup bearers so true Damon fashion not having it calls him a c word as well and then Rhaenyra sort of pulls the hand of the king pin, which I thought was really symbolic. She went straight and pulls the, the pin off of him and says, you're no hand of the king, chucks it down, you're a traitor. My father said that I was the queen, that I was going to do this. We knew this was coming, but seeing it play out 
is still really, really good. The way that they deliver it, the lines, the dialogue, the characters, just the way the scenes are put together is super intense. It's off, it's sort of standoffish. You know there's a war brewing. You know there's a rebellion. There's already a divide in houses. They're already clamoring for other houses to sort of rally to their cause. And this is going to culminate in a massive, massive scrap. And I cannot wait for it in season two. We get a sniff of it at the end of this episode. But anyway, she pulls the, the pin off, says you're a traitor. Then Otto says, I thought you'd say this. Come here, kind of let me show you something. And then the maester hands him a scroll, which he gives to Rhaenyra and says, check that out. She looks at the scroll and we can see briefly that it's the sort of um, premonition, if you like, or the poem or the story of the Song of Ice and Fire. So the dream that Aegon the Conqueror had about the long night, the long winter, i.e. the Night King and the Walkers, the big threat that's coming in the north that we know and see from Game of Thrones. She sees this and then it recalls in her mind what Alison said to her and also what Viserys said to her about a prince being promised and that it's going to be a man. Although we know in, as it turns out, the uh, Melisandre sort of turned around the fire priestess and said it could actually translate as a woman. And I know they sort of messed that up a little bit, but at this point in time, they're convinced it's a prince that is promised and it's going to be, you know, Aegon. That's what Alison is very confident in, in saying. And that's kind of what Otto is pointing out to Rhaenyra, that it's a prince that was promised, not a princess. It's the king that's now on the throne, a Targaryen of blood, Targaryen of your family lineage. So he, he sort of half and softly points out to her that she's wrong and says, look, the scripture's here. If you believe in the gods, you believe in your father, you believe what he stood for, you are actually the traitor. So she kind of looks at it. Damon's about, he pulls his sword out and says, enough's enough. Goes to take him out, puts up his little fighting stance with his sword. The king's guard behind him draw their swords as well. And Rhaenyra stops them. The dragon's about to go in and have a little chomp on Otto. Rhaenyra says, no, I'll give the answer at King's Landing. And then she turns around, walks away, and sort of says, give me some time to think about it. So it calls off the, the scrap that was definitely about to go down. Damon walks away. They all go inside. Otto pisses off. We then get the next scene where Rhaenyra says, I don't wish to rule over Ash and Bone. I'm, this, this isn't the way to do it. Fighting is what everybody's done for so long look where it's got us it's divided the kingdoms it's divided the houses what's the point in going to war and becoming queen if i'll rule over absolutely a graveyard basically which is kind of the route daenerys went down initially and we get a very quick character arc of that nature in this episode as well which we'll touch on in a minute so at this point she's very much no, I'm not going to war. I'm not going to continue what every other king and queen of my name has done. We can't rule this with fire and blood, even though that's the Targaryen slogan. I'm not doing it. We need to be amicable where possible. I'm not murdering people. How can I rule over citizens of a kingdom and of a realm who don't respect me? And I'm not concerned for their safety either. I'm going to take them out no matter what, essentially, is what you're telling me to do. And she says, I'm not going to do it. So she's got a point. Damon then sort of pipes up and says, what are you going to do about it? There's an enemy that's declared war on you. What is it exactly you're going to do? Rhaenyra says, clear the room to everybody else. So all her advisors, the hand of the king, and her respect, the maesters, everything, the king's guard leave. The children leave as well. So it's just her and Damon. They have a little bit of a clash of opinion. She mentions the conqueror's dream about the Song of Ice and Fire. Damon says, dragons make kings, not stories. Grabs around the throne and basically says, stop being stupid, you're a Targaryen. Bring some of that fire back, bring some of that passion back in terms of what made you your father who he is and what made you who you are going to be. So we move on from that. We then get a scene where we see Corlius, who I thought was dead because obviously we see the raft. They mention a massive accident at sea, but obviously he survived it. They thought he was dying. I thought he was completely kaput dead and he died off camera, but clearly he didn't because he's here. And Rhaenys approaches him and explains everything that's happened since he's been in sort of like a coma. Says that his son's dead, about his other son dying as well, about uh, Laurel, whatever his name was, got assassinated essentially because he was a threat to the crown. He also, She also tells him about Damon carving off the, the other guy's head, the brother, because he was trying to sort of claim that Rhaenyra's children were bastards, which they are. 
But Damon was not having it. She's told him everything about what's happened since he's been comatose and out of action, basically. And she kind of digs at him and says, all this happened because you left at sea. If you were here, this wouldn't have happened. Yet again, you've sacrificed your family for a little adventure and a little rough and tumble at sea, basically. And he says, she says to him, you know, your brother's died because he stood up for the house. Damon cut his head off. And Corlea says they won't bend the knee. They're not going to do that. And Rhaenys kind of says, Rhaenyra is actually the only one that's exercising restraint. Before you go in there, guns blazing. There's a hell of a lot of guys stood up there around a council table, all saying they need to go to war. And Rhaenyra is the only one that's saying no. So don't do that. And she actually sticks up for Rhaenyra, which was quite surprising. But I do still think she's got an alternate agenda. I think when the time is right, she will fucking strike. She will go in like Cersei or Joffrey does. They bide their time. They wait for the opportunistic moment. Then they go in. And I think this is what Rhaenys is doing. We see glimpses of it. The scene in the last episode where she goes in with the dragon. I wasn't sure if she was going to Dracarys their asses. Or whether she was just saying, I could have, but I'm not going to. Instead, I'm just going to back away for now. Because Alison gave her a little bit of a deal as well. Which we didn't hear one way or the other, completely, if Rhaenys took it one side or the other. So I think she is one to watch. She is going to bide her time and she is going to murder some fool because both her sons have been killed. And don't forget, she sat there and watched the maesters essentially piece together her son's face as she was dealing with the struggle of the death of her other relative. Father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. But anyway, she tries to, on camera, they're given this impression that she's on side. Really, really clever writing. So she's like, no, don't worry. rhaenyra has got it. She needs to be trusted. Don't go in there with your madness and try and announce a war because she's actually the only sensible one in the room. We then see Corlys and Rhaenys entering the Dragonstone Council room and the Kingsguard announces them coming in. Rhaenyra's kind of like, oh my god, you're alive. It's so good to see you, blah, blah, blah. Straight away, Corlys is like, yeah, thanks, where's Damon? And she says, oh, he had other matters to attend to, and we don't know what that is yet. They then talk about the Arryn Baratheon and Stark houses, about how they owe allegiances to Targaryen, and Rhaenyra reminds Cornelius, essentially, that he is also part of that sworn house. And he says, you know, he sort of gives a look as if to say, don't remind me of that, don't threaten me with my own promise then quickly remembers where he is and what promise he had made to Viserys. But he also says to Rhaenyra, the high tower treason cannot stand. And because of that, you've got all of my fleet and my army will be at your cause. So Rhaenyra's like, ah, oh. Rhaenys is kind of like, yeah. So again, I'm not completely bought into this, guys. I think they're going to play along. They're going to play nice. They might get a few of their own people killed in the process to make it look like they're on side. But believe you me, when the time is right, these fuckers will strike and it is coming. So at the minute, he's like, yeah, you can have my army. Don't worry. I've blocked off this part of the sea. It'll stop all the ships getting into King's Landing. It'll stop all the supplies. Like, yeah, I'm not buying it, mate. Not buying it. So at this point, he's like, yeah, we're on side with you. We completely get your calls. We understand what you're doing. And Corlea says he took the liberty of basically for, uh, fortifying the sea entry points. Like I said, he's going to squeeze the supplies from getting into King's Landing, which is how they're going to rush them out, flush them out a little bit like rats. We then see what I'm referring to, the younglings, all the kids talking about the dragons. And Rhaenyra basically says, we need someone to go to the Stark Baratheon and Arryn houses to remind them of their allegiance and to to bring up that promise as Bannerman. So the kids are like, yeah, we'll do it. Let us go on Dragonback. And in in the beginning, Rhaenyra's kind of like, oh, do I want to do that? Duh. And Luke's like, no, mom, come on. We're ready for this. Give us something to do. So Rhaenyra's like, yeah, okay. She agrees to it. She then says to them separately, I want these messages to be carried as messengers, not warriors. I don't want you getting involved in any drama. I don't want you getting involved in any fighting. And the minute she said this, I thought, one of them's going to die this episode. You won't lay on a line like that without one of them getting fucking mauled or getting into a scrap at least and getting badly injured. But watch this space. So she gives that message and they say, yeah, promise. They both swear oaths to her. Luke and Gisera that they're not going to get involved in anything. They're not going to start any riots. They are there as messengers only. 
to relay what she is saying as a rallying call, basically, for all the houses to go to her and to form an army getting ready to take over King's Landing and to throw off the usurpers. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. So we then get an amazing scene where we see the three dragons swooping off into the distance and we get that amazing Dance of the Dragons music. So they all fly off into the distance. We then see Damon walk in with a torch, singing in Old Valyrian in the dark in a temple somewhere. And we're like, uh. straight away, I clocked what was going on. He's going to claim one of the dragons that he was talking about earlier. So he, he is going around and essentially rounding up the dragons. It sort of reminds me of that scene where in Game of Thrones, where Tyrion is trying to tame almost or at least be friends with Viserion and Rhaegar when Daenerys is off being captured by the Dothraki and she disappears with Drogon after that scene with the Sons of the Harpy and she disappears. It reminds me of that scene where Tyrion's walking through in the dark with his torch except Damien's a lot more confident. He's singing in Old Valyrian. He's already trying to entice the dragon and say look I'm a Targaryen. We're of the same blood. Dragon's blood. You know, this is my proof. And he's very confident in his stride. And I think, mate, you're going to get chewed up. But it's Damon. He's fine. Walks into the dark, singing in Old Valyrian. And then we get this amazing scene where we see the dragon come out of the, the darkness. It's breathing fire. It's fucking huge. And Damon's kind of looking at it. The dragon looks at him. Damon sort of slows down a little bit as if to say, holy shit. And then, but continues to sing in Old Valyrian. So it continues to assert his dominance but also at the same time his respect for the dragon and the dragon's kind of like you're not scared of me oh, okay and it had the camera sort of goes into the dragon's eye view you see damien in the pupil and it's kind of got that mutual respect sort of feeling we then cut to this next scene where we're coming into the final scenes of the episode where he gets off of the dragon and in the background he's walking up to the the castle i love the set piece of this castle i love the rain just the look of the soldiers, it very much reminded me of Bloodmore, uh, Bloodborne or Demon Souls. That sort of medieval but twisted and fantasy style look to it. It just felt very dark, very mysterious, very like shit's going to go down. It was very atmospheric. So he's strolling towards Storm's End, the, the entrance to the, the keep. We get a massive, massive panning shot of Vagar in the background. So this is Aegon's dragon, if you remember this one here that he conquered a few episodes ago. He essentially stole it from the desert. It was supposed to go to the Valyrian house. It was the uh, Laurel, I think, dragon originally. And when he died, it should have gone to his sister. But Aemon wanted to prove something when he lost his eye, grew a pair of bollocks, went in there, and fair play to him, tamed one of the biggest dragons known to man. So he's now firmly in the possession of uh, Aemon. So the second I saw Vega, I thought, hang on a minute, isn't that? Aemon's dragon so does that mean Aemon's here and I thought here we go so he walks into the throne room we see the king stood there or the lord of where Storm's End whatever you want to call him and next to him is Mr. Eyepatch Mr. Sephiroth he's already there so we know it's going to go down we know he's already had a conversation what to expect we know the kids are going to kick off with each other but it starts off all nicey nicey the maester reads the scroll because the the lord can't read he reads the scroll that Luke gives to him and says, essentially, you know, what Rhaenyra has said the whole episode. She wants to rally the houses. Don't forget your promises that your father's made, your grandfather's made to my house. I'm asking you now to come to my aid as bannermen. The Lord of Storm's End gets incredibly offended by this and says, what is it you're offering me? How dare you try and remind me of a promise that my father made? I'm not just some dog you can whistle and I will come to your side. That's not how this works. That I got no respect. What is it your queen or your mother can offer me? And Luke kind of bats it down a bit and just says, look, she's the queen dude. Now you need to, you need to come to the aid because the queen's asking you to, and doesn't really know what to say. Then the Lord of Storm's End says, well, do you know what? The new King Aegon, and it appears your house can't decide who's queen, who's king. There's a queen over there. There's a king over there. There's obviously disloyalty in your house there's obviously no control there's no discipline so what kind of a king or queen is that luke has absolutely nothing to say because he's right ultimately and says what is it that your queen is offering me aegon's already offered me family unity he's promised that my sons 
and my daughters will have a place on the throne. Our houses will marry. What is it that your queen can offer me? He kind of just says, well, you know, a promise is a promise. And the Lord of Storms ends not having it. He just says, just get out. Tell your queen, I'm no dog. You can't just whistle to me and I'll come running. That's not how this works. So go and give that message back to her. Just as he's walking away, Amond pipes up, makes a little comment about the boy being strong and takes another dig at him. Luke's kind of like looking at him as if to say, well, do you want a piece of this or not? And the Lord of Storms ends like, not in my throne room. This is not happening. And Eamon says, I'm not here to start a fight. I just want an eye for an eye. He pulls his eye patch off and says, look at this. And he's pointing at his eye. He's kind of gone all like white walkery blue. It looks like dragon-esque a little bit. So great CGI again, great prosthetics. And he says to Luke, you know, I want you to carve your eye out and just give me back what I made. Chucks him the dagger onto the floor. I'm like, holy shit. Lord of Storms ends like, no, not in my throne room, not in this palace. Get out. Do it outside. I'm not having blood spilt in under these roo- under this roof. And Eamon's kind of like, yeah, cut your eye out, cut your eye out. And then Luke's like, no, nah, I'm not doing it. And anyway, the Lord of Storms end sticks up for Luke and says, no, it's not happening. Escort the prince back to his dragon. No blood is being shed under this roof, under my name. So he doesn't want any involvement in it. He sees that it's going south. Luke then goes out to his dragon gets on it and I noticed straight away as he was taken off he looks over to where Vagar was stood in the background behind one of the massive walls and Vagar is no longer there so we know straight away aemon has gone out the back he's grabbed his dragon and he's disappeared into the clouds he's going to ambush him I've seen it coming a mile off but the next scenes are absolutely fantastic TV Luke takes off on his dragon it's still pissing down with rain you've got the Kind of reminds me of that scene where Neo's fighting Agent Smith in Matrix Revolutions. You know, at the end when you've got the rain, it's all dramatic, it's all tense, it's all dark. All you've got is the sound effects of the rain and the thunder and the storm. And it just adds so much tension to what the scene is. I thought straight away what was going to happen is Luke was going to fly and Vega was just going to take him straight out. But actually what happens is a kind of a cat and mouse game. Luke's flying on his dragon. I can't recall exactly what the dragon's name is. It's got it looks very much like a smaller version of Drogon. And they're just sort of he's in the clouds. Then we all of a sudden, Luke's kind of looking around, looking around, nothing there, nothing there. It goes on for about 30 seconds a minute. Then all of a sudden, you just get this amazing scene where you see the outline of Luke's dragon, and above him in the clouds is the outline of Vagar, this absolute monster. And it's about three or four times the size of Luke's dragon. It just, the wingspan on it just towers over Luke's dragon. It's flying above him, and you could just see the outline of it sort of gliding through the clouds. And I just thought, holy shit. It just gives you an idea of the size of this thing and puts it into practicality, you know, the different types of dragon species, the different types of where they come from, what they look like. And just the scale of this bloody thing is is absolutely terrifying. So he's flying along on the dragon. We see it above him. We then get a really intense sort of chase scene between Vagar, which is Aemon's dragon, and Arax, I think it is, is uh, Luke's dragon. So the two dragons clock each other. They get a little bit too close. One of them tries to chomp the other. And then all of a sudden, Luke tries the uh, Luke's dragon, Arax, sort of glides through a almost like a ravine, like a canyon, and Vagar is too big to chase after him. So he goes through, Vagar pulls away and says, you know, Eamon's taunting him, saying, you're not going to get away with this. I'm coming for that. Are you owe me a debt? And until the debt's paid, this isn't over. Luke kind of gets out the other side, looks around, and then his dragon, Arax, notices that Vagar's coming down at him. Luke tries to get Arax to continue flying and get away. He's goes towards the break in the clouds and he notices that he feels that the dragon is starting to push back and sort of turn and and fight Vagar. And he's like, no, no, don't do it. Keep flying. Keep no, I'm I'm listen to me. I'm I'm commanding you. I'm doing and he's trying to like reassert his dominance and reassert his control. But the dragon's not having it. And it breathes fire at Vagar. It takes out the side of his face and he's kind of like he brushes it off. Eamon's like no Vagar, no Vagar. And then all of a sudden the dragons are out of control. They're not listening to their masters. They're not listening to either of them. And they're just basically being dragons. They almost go into primal nature. They go into that fight or flight. All of a sudden the discipline goes out the window. And what we see next is Luke escaping into the open clouds, the sun, 
the blue sky, the white clouds, the nice fluff, and he thinks he's got away. He breaks out of the storm, looks around, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> Vagar just comes at him. This is the scene here that I saved because I absolutely loved it. He comes gliding out. Vagar grabs Arax, the dragon, literally shakes it like that, and it just shreds Arax to pieces. You just see his head fly off. The wing flies off. There's blood everywhere. The tail falls down. And Eamon's like, no, 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 no. It's like shouting at the dragon saying, stop, stop, stop. It's too late. Arax is decimated. He's been turned into mincemeat. And with that, Luke just falls to his death as well. And all we see is Luke falling into the sea. Multiple pieces of Arax falling into the sea. And Eamon looking absolutely distraught in terms of what's happened. He's kind of like, oh, fuck, I've just started something here. And actually, this is the start of the war. Believe it or not, we get the next scene it's very sad, very somber music. It's slow motion. Damon's walking up to Rhaenyra. She's facing the fire at Dragonstone. He sort of goes up to her, whispers in her ear, and sort of moves away. The camera slowly goes towards the back of Rhaenyra, who's staring at the fire. And you just know he's just told her that Luke's been killed or he's not come back. And you can guess as to what's happened or they've had reports that the dragon was destroyed. The dragon was shredded. I don't know at this point what she's been told. But we get the gist that she's been told of what's happened or she knows that there's foul play. And then we get the slow pan in scene. It stops just in front of her and then she slowly turns around and she's got a face like a smacked ass. And you just know, you can see the pain, you can see the passion, you can see the anger in her face. She doesn't say anything. All you've got is like slow violin, almost like the Red Wedding type of music. Slow violins playing. Very dramatic scene, slow panning camera. And it's dark and she's staring into the fire and all of a sudden she turns around and she's just like scowling. She's just super, super angry. And I'm like, holy shit. So next, and that's how it ends. So next season is going to be Dance of the Dragons, guys. This is how it's going to start. She started this episode and this is what I was saying earlier about her character arc. Very quickly going down the route that Daenerys did. It took Daenerys seasons to snap. It took her seasons to go mad basically and become the mad queen and fall into that trap that she didn't want to become what she always said she'd never be it took Rhaenyra an episode <laughs> it might be different in terms of time jump and years and things like that but in one episode she went from no let's do this amicably let's see this through to by the end of the episode she wanted blood because when she put her kids in the firing line she ain't fucking about and this is how it ends you just get the panning shot of Rhaenyra. She turns from the fire. She's staring into the camera. The camera's slowly moving towards her face. And it's pure hatred, pure anger. She's not really crying. She's, you could just see that she is ready to shred. And this is all because of what happened between Aemon and Luke. Dun, dun, dun. It ends. What, a f what an amazing episode. I was absolutely glued to my TV the whole time. It was actually around 55 minutes to an hour this episode ran for. But it felt like 20 minutes. It was over before I knew it because I was so hooked on what was going on. The dialogue was perfect. The acting was brilliant. Love the scenes with the dragons, especially that bit at the end where Eamon's chasing Luke on his dragon. And you get the back and forth and just seeing that actually these are fucking dragons. As much as you want to tame them, as much as you think you're in control, Daenerys had the same issue with Drogon. You piss that thing off enough, it's going to turn on you. It's that same old uh, belief and idea that animals, even dogs, cats, whatever it is, you can train them to be the most perfect domesticated animals that you want, but there is still that primal instinct. And when it feels threatened and it feels it has to defend itself, you can't stop that primal instinct from kicking in. And this is exactly what we saw. The kids are just bickering amongst themselves about something petty. One of them lost an eye and he's like, I'm not going anywhere until I get an eye back. It's like, it should have, it should have stopped, but it got out of hand. The parents didn't really address it. They just broke them up and just let them be. And this is the, the outcome of it. They've crossed paths again. The second I saw Aemon in that room with the Lord of Storm's End, I knew shit was going to kick off. I knew Aemon wasn't going to let him go. I knew even when the Lord was like, not in my hall, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, he's just going to go outside. He's just going to run that fucking big dragon at the back and chase him halfway home, which is exactly what happened. But Aemon just wanted to scare him, I think. He wanted to feel the power. He wanted to feel like he was in control. Obviously, he did want his eye physically, just to say, I got your eye. But... I think if it would have come down to it, I don't think he would have cut his eye out. I just think he would have made him shit himself and just sort of say, I'm the boss. You might have a Targaryen name, but I'm Targaryen by blood, by nature. 
I think he wanted to just really, really intimidate him and scare the shit out of him, but it backfired. The dragons didn't listen. The dragons ended up fighting, and Arix got shredded to pieces. So did Luke, and he fell to his death. So absolutely nuts way to end the episode. And we see a lovely Rhaenyra come into terms with the death of her son and actually say him, you know, in one very quick glance, fuck what I said earlier, let's go, Damon. let's get those dragons, we're going to storm King's Landing, which I think is going to be the opening of season two. I cannot wait for it. Unfortunately, we have to wait until 2024 to get season two. I thought it was going to be next year, but apparently, no, we've got to wait two years, so I'm absolutely gutted at that. But at the same time, if it takes two years to make a series like this, I'm all for waiting. It's prime TV. If I was to give this episode a rating, The Black Queen, episode 10, is a solid, solid 9 out of 10. I was tempted to give it a 10 out of 10, but I have to be critical about some of the stuff we've seen. There was a little bit of time jumping going on. The stuff with Corlius didn't completely make sense. But apart from that, and this is me being picky, apart from that, I thought it was a fantastic episode. I really, really enjoyed it. Couldn't stop looking at the screen. I actually paused eating at certain points. One, because of the baby thing. It was just nasty. I'm like... Even for Game of Thrones, this is fucked. The dragon scenes, the dialogue, the the rainness. I noticed that she didn't bend the knee and Damon being Damon. We had loads of dragons in this, but it made sense. Otto was trying to push some buttons. Eamon was after an eye. It was, it was everything that you want from an episode. It was almost perfect for me. Just a couple of little gripes and it's just me being picky. But I was very, very tempted to give this one a 10. But what a way to end this season, guys. And that is the end of my review of house of the dragon it is done i hope you did enjoy it if you haven't seen the prior episodic reviews feel free to go and check them out i've linked each one individually in the description of the video if you want to go and check them out once you've watched the series yourself until next year or the year after if you're just hanging around for the house of the dragon review i will probably do season two can't say i'm going to do the same for rings of power although a lot of you have reached out to me and said please do rings of power I might have calmed down by season two. I might give it a chance, but I don't know. Don't hold me to it. But this, on the other hand, is absolutely sailing. It is perfect TV. I was a little bit dubious about episode one and two. When it first started, I thought, oh, it's a bit slow burn. I don't know. But it's literally, it's a hype train. From episode three onwards, it's just got better and better and better. And it just keeps, it keeps on delivering great TV. It smashes it out of the park for all the right reasons game of thrones to the core and it's the reasons why we fell in love with game of thrones in the first place so cannot wait for season two apparently they've signed off on at least three or four seasons so we're going to get even more of this guys as the years roll on i'm all here for it but let me know in the comments once you've seen the episode what you think about it is there anything you think i've missed what would you have rated it out of 10 and are you looking forward to season two stay tuned for more tv and movie reviews guys they are going to be coming even with house of the dragon done and rings of power i'm going to continue the tv and movie reviews as and when i pick up stuff so stay tuned for that gaming content still here as well the podcast i promise is coming soon i know you guys keep reaching out for it i've just been super busy with pushing the channel forward live streaming and this is a very busy time of year for games in general gotham knights has just come out modern warfare 2 is out friday um i'm going to be doing scorn i want to pick up the shadow of rose dlc resident evil 8 for halloween god of war is out soon it's just very very busy and also i'm still doing my horizon forbidden west playthrough as well as well as uploading the original well, I said the original Modern Warfare 2019 playthrough. That's coming up in parts at the moment as well. So it's a busy, busy, busy time of year. And I'm also gearing up for Christmas. I've got another little one on the way in February. So it's very, very busy for me at the minute. So thank you for bearing with. I hope you're enjoying the content. Stay tuned for the channel for more. And stay tuned for the coming year as well for more and more content that is firing down the line. Just very quickly, just to give you a heads up and a bit of a teaser... I've managed to dig out my old PS1 and PS2, so there's going to be a bit more classic retro streaming. I'm probably going to be doing a lot of full game playthroughs, but there is definitely either way going to be live streams around classics like The Two Towers, Return of the King, Path of Neo, the original God of War, God of War 2, I'm going to do God of War 3 again as well, uh, the original Tomb Raider. I just want to get into some of the classics again because... They're the reason why I'm sat in front of you today, passionate about gaming. So stay tuned for more. Stay tuned for more content. Hit the bell icon, subscribe, leave a thumbs up, and I will see you again in the next video or stream. Take care of yourselves, guys. Peace.